Exercise by Dr. Mary Wood Allen You said to me, my daughter, that you wanted to join the class in physical culture. I asked you why, and you said, because you thought you needed to build up in certain parts of the body. You were defective in muscular development. You needed also to acquire grace, you thought. And I said, is muscular development the primary object of physical education? You seem to think that it is. Now I want to talk to you a little along that line and to demonstrate to you, if I can, that physical education is not primarily for the building up of big muscle or for the gaining of power to do great feats of bodily strength or skill. The object of physical education is to develop a quickly responsive, flexible instrument for the soul to use. For that is what the body is. Physical culture, rightly conducted, aims to secure the highest condition of the body through the exercises that are required by the laws of the body. Law, physical law, governs the body, and exercise should be according to this law. The first object of exercise is to make a vital supply for the whole body. This is first secured by proper attitude. If we stand or sit properly, we gain a proper position of the vital organs, and then they will do their work well, and the result will be more perfect nutrition. The use of certain organs increases supply, and the use of others quickens waste. A balance should be maintained between the two. We must nourish the life-sustaining organs before using the organs which use our brain supply. Therefore, we want to be sure that we are working according to these laws. A great many people have an idea that physical culture means building up big muscle. They measure the muscles of the arm and of the leg and judge by their increase in size of the value of the exercise. This is not a correct measurement. Individuals may weigh themselves down by development of muscles until they have not sufficient internal vital force to carry so much weight. If we could only balance between the organs which supply nutriment and the organs which use it up, we would keep in perfect health. We want to learn how to secure a maximum of results with a minimum of force. That is, we want the body to be quickly responsive, to be flexible, to be so that we can use it for the things we want to do without wasting strength, and yet without being weighed down by a superabundance of muscular tissue. The first desideratum in taking exercise is to have every organ of the body free. Therefore, a gymnastic dress is a necessity. Then we should have the exercise conducted by someone who understands the peculiarities of each individual and knows just what exercises are suited for her in her special physical condition. They should also be directed by one who understands perfectly that the girl with an anemic brain that is, with the brain having too little blood, cannot be conducted on the same plan as the exercise of the girl who has a superabundance of blood in her brain. The best exercise is that which employs the mind pleasantly. A good deal of exercise may be obtained in housework, and, if conducted with pleasure in the work, may be of great physical advantage. Not long ago, I listened to a very charming talk by a lady whose dress betokened her a woman of society. She wore white kid gloves, a dainty flower bonnet, and in herself appeared an exponent of leisure and happiness. Her address was entitled The Home Gymnasium, and I supposed that it would consist of descriptions of machinery that could be put up in one's own dwelling for gymnastic purposes, but I soon found that her home gymnasium meant household duties. She said one could scrub the table and obtain the best exercise for arms and chest, and at the same time produce an article or piece of furniture which would be a delight to the eye in its whiteness and brightness. She said that in scrubbing the floor, one obtained very much the same movement that would be given in the gymnasium, while at the same time the exercise would conduce not only to the personal advantage, but to the happiness of the family. She spoke of sweeping and dusting and bed making, and expressed herself as competent to do all these kinds of work, in fact, as doing them. And she said she never felt more of a lady than when scrubbing her kitchen floor, and she was not ashamed to be seen by her friends at this work. If anyone rang the doorbell, she said she would simply put on a clean apron, 
and go to the door and remark without hesitation that she was just scrubbing her kitchen floor, but she was glad to see her friends. This sort of a home gymnasium is at the command of nearly every girl, and if she can bring herself to feel an interest in this home gymnastic exercise, she may find it conducive not only to her own physical well-being, but to the comfort and happiness of all about her. The question is often asked whether bicycle riding is injurious for girls, and I would say that in my opinion, it depends largely upon the girl. Has she good common sense? Of course, I am speaking of the girl who is in a normal condition of health. A girl of extreme delicacy, or who is subject to some functional difficulty, or the victim of some organic disease, might not find it advantageous to ride. A physician should, in these cases, be consulted. But for the ordinary girl, the girl of fairly good health, if she will learn how to sit properly upon her saddle, will have the good sense to ride with judgment, it seems to me that the exercise must be productive of great good. My own experience is somewhat limited. I made some discoveries in my attempts to ride. In the first place, I learned that it was important to know how to sit. In reading a book on physical culture and hygiene for women by Dr. Anna Galbraith, I found this sentence. Sit upon the gluteal muscles and not upon the perineum. This was a revelation to me. I found that I had been doing the thing which was not proper, and bearing the weight almost entirely upon the perineum had caused constant rectal irritation. The gluteal muscles, closely held together, form a firm support for the body without injuring any of the vital organs. I found that by distributing the weight a little upon the handlebars and some upon the feet, I was able to sit with less weight and heaviness upon the saddle. I found, too, that it was quite important to have the saddle high enough so that the legs might be fully extended at each stroke. And with these precautions, I found the wheel a source both of enjoyment and of strength. The harm done by the wheel, I believe in most instances, to be due to an ill-adapted saddle or a lack of good judgment in the amount of exercise taken. It is such a fascinating exercise, one seems to be flying and scarcely realizes how much of nerve force is being expended. If the girl learning to ride will be prudent, gauging the amount of exercise by the amount of strength, if she will gradually acquire the needed strength before attempting long wheeling trips, if she will be judicious and not ride perhaps during the first two or three days of menstruation, there seems to be no reason why the ordinary girl should not be entirely benefited by this most delightful form of exercise. It is not as objectionable to any degree as to the exercise of dancing. Dancing is a most fascinating amusement, and if it only could be conducted under proper circumstances, it would be very delightful. In itself, it is not so objectionable as in its concomitants, the late hours, the improper dressing, the hearty suppers in the middle of the night, the promiscuous association, and the undue familiarity of the attitude of the round dance are what make dancing objectionable. If dancing could be conducted out of doors, in the daylight, with intimate friends, without the round dances, only those forms of dancing which may be likened to gymnastics, as the contra dance, the cotillion, the objections to dancing would be largely removed. But I am of the opinion that a large share of the fascination of dancing would go at the same time. Skating is a delightful, invigorating form of exercise, if conducted with judgment. One objection to it is that the girl will skate until wearied, and then, in that exhausted condition, perhaps ride home or take a long, tiresome walk from the pond to her residence, all of which is sapping her unduly and annulling the value of the skating as an exercise. Lawn tennis is delightful and beneficial provided it is undertaken with due judgment and the girl is properly dressed. In fact, the subject of dress is so closely associated with that of exercise that they can never be considered separately. Even the moderate exercise of walking, conducted in the dress of the fashionable woman, is in itself an element of danger, whereas more violent exercise in a loose dress becomes a means of increased strength and vigor. I am often asked if girls should be allowed to run up and down stairs. 
I see no reason why girls should not go up and down stairs just as freely as boys if they are properly dressed. But going up and down stairs in tight clothing is certainly very injurious. End of What a Young Woman Ought to Know Exercise by Dr. Mary Wood Allen